Hello, my name is David Plyler, and I'm one of the producers at Concerts from the Library of Congress. It is my great pleasure to be speaking with pianist Christopher Taylor today, who will be performing several of Liszt's solo piano transcriptions of Beethoven's symphonies for us as part of our Rehearing Beethoven Festival. The idea behind this festival was to present all of Beethoven's symphonies in a variety of transcriptions, ranging from solo piano to wind nonette, with the aim of making these works accessible in the Coolidge Auditorium. When the pandemic hit, our mission changed to making them available to you at home. And Christopher and many of our other artists adapted uh, remarkably well and graciously to the circumstances, allowing us to move ahead with the project. Uh, welcome, Christopher. Thank you very much. In addition to a vast amount of repertoire uh, that you perform from Bach to Liszt, uh, Messiaen and Ligeti, um, uh, Christopher Taylor uh, is one of the handful of pianists in the world um, who has taken on this remarkable series of piano transcriptions of Beethoven symphonies um, made by Franz Liszt. And uh, before we get into the specifics of the particular pieces that um, you'll be performing uh, uh, under the Aegis of the Library, which includes symphonies one, two, and five, um, I'd love for you to say a few words about the scope of this project, um, uh, how you're managing performing such a rich, uh, well-known body of works, but as a soloist at the piano. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's been sort of the fulfillment of a long-standing dream of mine to to undertake these uh, fantastic uh, transcriptions. So when I was first becoming uh, interested, enamored with music um, at age sort of six and seven, I, uh, I think my entry point was actually the Beethoven symphonies. So my parents are not musicians per se, but certainly music lovers and they had, uh, uh, they had recordings of lots of different pieces, but uh, the uh, Beethoven symphonies uh, were sort of prominent on the shelf. And uh, uh, also, as it happened, uh, we had some old scores of, of miniature scores of the nine Beethoven symphonies. And so I would spend hours listening to them and trying to figure out how the markings on the scores uh, correlated with what I was hearing. And uh, so uh, these, uh, these pieces are incredibly dear to me. And, uh, you know, then I wound up starting piano lessons. And so uh, as a result, it seemed like these pieces were not accessible to me. Uh, uh, although I, I became aware quite early, I think, you know, probably when I was about eight, I stumbled across a copy of the score of these transcriptions. I thought that's pretty cool. And, you know, I tried to play, you know, a few bars and I realized, damn, these are hard. Um, so I, uh, uh, it sort of went on the back burner uh, and stayed there on the back burner until about eight years ago when a presenter in, in Moscow actually was uh, uh, creating a, a series where all the transcriptions would be played. And they contacted me and said, you know, asked, would you be interested in doing symphonies four and five? And so I said, you know, unquestionably. And uh, so those were my first two symphony transcriptions that I learned, four and five. And it was you know, 2012 or something like that. So uh, by that point, you know, I played a whole lot of difficult music and I had a much better idea of how to tackle them than I did when I was eight. Um, uh, but, but definitely uh, learning them sort of opened up my eyes to, a, a, a you know, a new sort of frontier in, in uh you know, the development of my technique and my musical uh, persona. And, uh, well, before you got into <clears throat> the specifically the, the list transcriptions, I know you said that you saw them early on, but yes. before you learned them as, as a performer, uh, were you aware, had you read through some of these other reductions that were out there of, of and I say reductions as opposed to transcription on purpose, but of um, other ways that people had tried to do these before list or even after list? No, no, I, uh, 
I, I had never investigated that question. And uh, I mean, I know there are a lot of transcriptions out there, you know, an archive somewhere in gathering dust. Um, but I, I've not made an extensive study of how they compare. I mean, it's uh, always kind of my assumption that it can't possibly, none of them can possibly be better than the list. Um, I think that's a good assumption. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but actually, you know, one of my students uh, did a, uh, a doctoral project on, um, you know, some of these exotic transcriptions of various pieces, you know, uh, uh, Beethoven for, you know, the most, un, un, uh, you know, implausible combinations, you know, two flutes and bassoon or something. And uh, right. uh, it's remarkable what's out there. Uh, and it... it it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, a wonderful way to get a fresh perspective on, uh, you know, these works that are obviously extremely familiar. Uh, anyway, so having learned symphonies four and five, I decided, you know, this, this is it. I've got to learn the other seven symphonies. And uh, so just gradually as opportunities arose, you know, bit by bit, year by year, I chipped away at it. So I, I sort of started in the middle with four and five, and I kind of worked my way out from there. So the uh, so the most recent that I learned were one and nine, and I first performed those. Uh, uh, well, number nine, I've only performed once, and that was uh, that was on February first. So I just made it under the wire before the pandemic hit. Uh, so that was, uh, yeah, that was a wonderful experience. And uh, I actually reworked um, the list transcription of the Ninth Symphony. I mean, I, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but uh, he did it in such a way that theoretically the pianist can play, you know, a representative sampling of all the notes, including the notes that are sung by the soloists and chorus. Uh, and I decided I was going to rework it a little bit so that I could have actual singers uh, on stage with me during the finale. Uh, so I, I reworked it so there were five singers, uh, you know, soprano, alto, two tenors, and a bass. And, uh, and so the parts of Liszt's transcription that are just duplicating the vocal parts, I stripped those out and I added a few more of the instrumental lines. Um, and so, uh, and yeah, I thought that turned out very well. I think, uh, you know, I've, I've heard it done that way before. And I, I think that does, that is a nice way to do it. I mean, the list mm -hmm. solution, that was, he, um, he fought hard against having to do that, do that right. so for right. this reason. He didn't know how to do it. Right. Um, his, his particular solution was not a bad one in that he, but he has places where there's six staves of music uh, showing the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the soloist parts, the choral parts, and then the, the piano part. Right. And he, he finds ways to uh, to do his, the best to, to kind of bring out the important parts. But, right. um, but it's interesting that you have, um, as a reference, you have, those other things as a, kind of an insight into what one might bring out if one were just to play it by yourself. But I like I like your solution. I think that that is something that he probably would have been happy happy to have happen. <laughs> well, and in future performances, uh, it's very likely I will not always have access to singers. I mean, once performances resume, because uh, you know I I had various performances of this on the agenda and uh, of course in the case of the library of congress it's been converted to an internet format but other ones have just been delayed repeatedly right. and uh, so but you know once i'm back at it with live performances i mean there will probably be a couple where i won't have access to singers and so i'll have to do the original list version so i'll have to shift gears and relearn some things uh so that that you know i have yet to really tackle uh the differences between my version and list's version uh so that that will uh you know that'll be potentially a little confusing but i think it it, it should be doable i mean uh, i guess the closest analogy to that problem in my prior experiences shifting back and forth between Goldberg variations on a single manual and on a double manual piano. 
know, and uh, I found my experience was sort of once you're in the groove, you know, you, your brain gets sent down one pathway or the other pathway. So anyway. Right. No, that was definitely, I wanted to, to bring that up uh, at some point, uh, but I mean, that's that's an as aspect that's unique to you as well, and that there aren't many people who are even aware of that uh, double manual piano uh, and, and right. the effects of playing on it. Um, but I can mm -hmm. imagine that that just getting <clears throat> getting ingrained in a particular way, this is uh, one of the, one of the uh, somebody I know who speaks about this as a percussionist speak of this as like re-sticking a piece. Like mm -hmm. once you've got it kind of ingrained in a particular way, it's difficult to, to switch between them, but yeah. Um, yeah. But it's kind of like this for all of the list symphony um, transcriptions. I mean, to greater and lesser degrees, maybe to the, the greatest degree in the ninth symphony because of the choral component. Mm -hmm. But there's um, information that's given to you that you have to choose to accept or disregard in some in some way. In that case, like he's not expecting you to, you know, play all these things, but you do have to. There are cases where. Um, uh, in the uh, where you have to choose whether to rearticulate uh, where the singers sing the same pitch that's just been played by a member of the orchestra or not, mm -hmm. you know, you have that you have that option, but you have to take all this information and make a ton of different decisions, yes. and, uh, and that's a, just an interesting aspect of of these in general. And, I, and I'm curious, um, do you try um, a lot of different ways of playing it before arriving at the the version that you end up choosing? Oh, for sure, there's plenty of experimentation. I mean, of course, that's true of any piece, but in in this case, as you said, sometimes Liszt prints an extra staff or two above the the main uh, the main body of the score, and uh, you know shows a couple of other notes that he doesn't necessarily expect you to play, but notes that are present in the orchestra part, uh, you know, and very often attempting to do them all is just completely unplayable. Uh, you know, it would require 20 fingers. Um, but sometimes, you know, there are things in there where you can perhaps grab a couple of extra notes and uh, um, these osea parts, uh, you know, the, you know, from the Italian term meaning alternative. Um, so there are quite a few of those in this piece. And of course, in, in the rest of Liszt's music also, there there can be osseas. And, um, and, and so, you know, there's you know, a fair amount of sort of trying out different versions and different fingerings and um, different pedalings. I mean, the uh, you know, for instance, the, the middle pedal, the sostenuto pedal, which, you know, is not used very much by a lot of pianists, is extremely helpful in these because it allows you to choose particular pitches that you want to continue to resonate. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's very useful for orchestral music where, you know, you can have a French horn that's sitting on a particular note for you know, 20 seconds or whatever, while the rest of the orchestra is doing different stuff. And, uh, you know, if you try to do, if you try to mimic that effect just using the standard right pedal, the damper pedal, uh, you know, chances are you're going to get, you know, you're going to have to make some compromises. It's going to get blurry in ways that you don't want it to get. Um, but with the middle pedal, you can sustain those particular notes and, uh, you know, get these particular resonances, uh, long-term resonances that really help to create a sort of orchestral effect. That's fantastic and so interesting. The um, <clears throat> you know, one thing before we um, move on to more of these decisions that you're making about about how to adapt these things is um, one other thing I wanted to say about the extra staves that sometimes Liszt will put in there. Well, he'll, where he'll indicate, say, like the solo baritone or you know or some some type of uh some type of uh vocal line or something like that um he'll have that it'll still be articulated in the piano but there's something about seeing it there so you know that maybe that's i mean obviously you would know that that's important just from knowing the piece but you know if it were just like say a lesser known work or something like that there's 
an element that like you think, okay, here's a prominent line that I'm going to choose. It's already in the piano part, but maybe my pinky has to play it, you know, <laughs> for, for right. the complexity of it. But it's clearly important to the composer to make it make me aware that that's a line that I need to keep intact. Right. I think that list was good about uh, giving that kind of indication. And another thing that he would give, and I'm curious how if this affects your playing um, in a particular way, is the um, <clears throat> one of the things that he was assiduous about in these particular works, um, not so much in later years, but in these particular works, um, is giving uh, indications as to the the instrument playing that right. uh, that uh, particular line. And how does does that how, does that impact you at all, or are you looking at it? From a pian more of a pianistic, I mean, it's impossible to I guess divorce yourself from the orchestral sound of these pieces, but right. that we all know so well. But what what's your reaction with that? It's definitely helpful to get these little reminders from Liszt that you know this is supposed to be a clarinet or whatever. Now, of course, I mean the piano is not you know obviously a, a sampler or some you know electronic instrument that provides you know. Uh, quasi-perfect re reproductions of the timbres of the different orchestral instruments. Um, but, you know, you can sometimes hint at the, and, and get some inspiration from the changes of color that, that the original orchestral version has. And of course, you know, if, if, you know, purists who object to these transcriptions, of course, that's the first thing that they complain about is that the, the absence of these coloristic changes. And I mean, there's no doubt that that is a loss um, when you move to these transcriptions. Um, but of course, I believe that there are some, some countervailing uh, gains to be had as well. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, just seeing, for instance, in the Fifth Symphony, uh, Towards the end of the development, you have the the chords that are winds, strings, winds, yeah. strings, winds, strings, and uh, just uh, and so I mean, List writes, you know, winds, strings, and uh, you know, writes it a couple of times, and then you figure out what the pattern is, um, uh, and you know, it's as I said, it's impossible to you know, truly create wind sound and then truly create string sound. Um, uh, but, you know, you can do some changes in the way you, you know, your voice and in the way you pedal those, uh, those chords to create, you know, and enhance that sense of contrast. And... Uh, it seems like know. he also helps, it help, he helps you out a bit sometimes too with registral decisions that yeah, um yeah. that really kind of bring out uh some of those uh differentiations um uh, with with registers that maybe are not necessarily used in the orchestral version as well just to to provide some of that uh variability when he doesn't have the option of a different instrument that's right that's right and uh you know sometimes even just sort of extra figurations or extra sort of a fundamental figure filler or something like that and of course, one of the uh, perennial issues with transcriptions is when, you know, the the strings just have tremolando. They're just going chugga, 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 chugga. Um, you know, you can't really do that on a piano very convincingly with repeated notes. You know, chugga, chugga, chugga. Uh, it would sound kind of ridiculous and, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be suitable to how the instrument works. Right? Repeated notes are always a battle. Um, uh, so, I mean, the standard solution, of course, is to turn them into, you know, tremolando chords like this, sort of alternating, you know, high-low, 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 or whatever. Um, and uh, so, but sometimes, I mean, Liszt will do different, you know, will, I mean, that's sort of his go-to solution. So, uh, you know, at the, the opening of the Ninth Symphony or something like that, instead of just with alternating notes like that. You know, if you put the pedal down, you can get sort of the kind of shimmering, uh, yeah. restless kind of quality that the strings are able to produce with repeated notes. 
you know, he would also do though, um, he would do things like make a measure tremolos or uh, so that you have, uh, especially like an upper register so that, that creates a very specific kind of uh, effect or, or occasionally adding in there's arpeggi arpeggiations or something like that as a way to fill out the sound in a non-sustaining instrument. Like those are, <clears throat> there's kind of a variety, a wide variety of solutions I think that come into play. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think that he always, he would, you know, decry sometimes when it came down to just having like a bass tremolo. <laughs> like, well, right. so like, what else can you do? Like, how are you, you going to make a timpani, uh, timpani roll or something? Right. Like that? Like, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... And in places like that, I mean, sometimes I, uh, you know, I'll just subtly alter the exact way Liszt notated it. Uh, so towards the end of the second symphony, for instance, uh, towards the end of the finale, uh, you know, there's big sort of tremolando that's supposed to be timpani. And, uh, you know, Liszt writes it out measured uh, I decided, eh, I think that sounds a little lame, so I sped it up and I did an unmeasured tremolando. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, I mostly, you know, I, I definitely respect the way Liszt did it. Um, but as I said, sometimes, for instance, when he prints some of these extra notes, and if I figure out a way to do it using, particularly using the sostenuto pedal, which you know, when Liszt wrote these transcriptions, he didn't have access to that. Um, so I, I take advantage of what the uh, modern piano is capable of. Well, that's another kind of question. I have a couple specific uh, questions about this, but um, <clears throat> that, that comes into play is this adaptation. I, I, I have a feeling that, um, you know, obviously can't channel Liszt to, to talk to him ourselves, but um, that he would expect a performer to adapt to the situation that the hall they're in, the uh, p instrument that they have. And so I just imagine that, if, you know, given a, a particular caliber of performer that he would be just fine with these types of modifications that you're talking about, especially because he often would give al alternate versions. Like I feel like in order to to give the performer the chance to, to make those decisions based on you know, what the scenario that they have. But there's another type of decision I'm curious about um, uh, how you approach it. And one of them would be, uh, sometimes he'll be very specific about which hand is to take, uh, say a, a particular melody or something like that. And so he'll, he'll enforce a crossed, uh, crossed hand. So I'm thinking of the, um, for instance, the Andante um, from the Fifth Symphony. Right. Um, starts with the left hand, um, he's notated it as such, I don't wanna, yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah, and with a really low bass in the right hand, right. Um, but in order to kind of uh, give a particular um, uh, a voicing with the uh, thumb of the left hand, and so I'm curious, do you tend to? Um, but sometimes, I mean, I can imagine that people might choose to not do that. Is that something that right. you typically follow, or do you just kind of adapt it, just depending on what feels most comfortable? Yeah, I mean that one that you mentioned, the beginning of the second movement of the fifth. Uh, it's sufficiently eccentric that, I mean, clearly Liszt had something particular in mind and trying to figure out what that is. I mean, there's a little bit of guesswork there. Um, you know, in practice, I tried it without the crossing just to see what it felt like and what it sounded like. And, uh, uh, but I, I decided, you know, it's not that big a deal. It's kind of fun crossing the hands, so why not? And uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it does the fact that, you know, with the left hand, the thumb is playing the, the highest notes in the melody. That maybe gives a particular kind of emphasis to those top notes, which, you know, usually that there's some musical sense in that. Um, so why not? Now, there are other cases where I don't have very much compunction about doing a little rearrangement if, if I find some clever solution that allows me to, you know, uh, uh, facilitate some particularly awkward passage. Um, so uh, cheating, as we pianists call it, you know, when you... Uh, a note that's printed on the upper staff that looks like it's supposed to be done with the right hand. If it, you happen to be able to grab that with the left hand, you know, why not? Particularly, you know, if the notes are flying fast and furious, uh, you know, 
God himself in the audience isn't going to be able to tell that you cheat. Right. So, um, uh, you know, even people who have played it probably, it whizzes by so fast that they can't tell. Um, so, uh, and similarly, I mean, List sometimes puts in fingerings, and, you know, those are always worth taking seriously. Well, one uh, of those I wanted to bring up is the at the beginning of the Fifth Symphony, yeah. We had repeat re repetitions of the second finger, in yeah. the um, and I'm curious about about your reaction to that. I mean, it's it's not like a prescription. I think it's it's just something that he's suggesting. Yeah, and something particular to his technique. And uh, as it happens, I've never been satisfied with how my single finger repetition works. I don't know if I just need to spend many more hours practicing that, but I just feel like I can always get much more rhythmic definition and uh and precision if i switch fingers on repeated notes and uh you know in particular you know the note that's on the beat if you play that with your thumb very often that's very helpful and helps to uh, define what you're doing rhythmically more clearly um uh so yeah those as i said i take them into consideration but if, if I feel like dumping it, I, I do so without uh, <laughs> a great deal of guilt. Yeah. Well, it seems like another <clears throat> aspect of all of these works is that you know, List is in List is uh, trying to. I think, and I think that this is a distinction between <clears throat> these particular works, uh, these transcriptions and reductions, is that he's trying to create performance versions of these pieces. Yeah. They're meant to be, because I don't know who they're for. If it's, this, these are not playable by amateurs. They're not playable by most professionals, really. Right. I mean, we'll say they're, they're, I mean, and I don't mean that like in an overly virtuosic sense, like where there's, it's just, they're so dense. There's, but at the same time, there's such a great deal of uh, clarity that's written in kind of forced into the transcription, but mm -hmm. just takes a really fine pianist to, to be able to bring those things out. And mm -hmm. I guess I, um, uh, I, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I'm so pleased that you're doing these pieces because I, I do think that they're meant to be heard as a performance of as a piano work of the orchestral Absolutely. version, and so I'm, I, I know that it's, it's hard to, to kind of again separate yourself from your knowledge of the orchestral versions, but how do you relate to these as piano pieces? Right, right, yeah. Well, as I said, I mean, I was. Uh, to some extent, you know, motivated by you know, my envy of orchestras and their uh, their uh, ability to enjoy this, uh, you know, this spectacular music. Um, and, but you know, I'm not motivated quite as much by the idea that I must create some sort of uh, you know faint carbon copy of uh, the orchestral experience. Uh, I, I do view these as sort of independent works that, uh, you know, have their own artistic merit. And uh, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, Liszt pulled out all the stops. He was, he was definitely trying to push the limits of what the instrument is capable of. And its ability to create, you know, these mighty uh, sonorities and to uh, capture, you know, in a lucid way, the, the complexity and uh, ingenuity of, of, of Beethoven's original ideas. Um, so, I mean, unquestionably, you know, I've learned a lot about piano technique from these, and uh, I've learned lessons that I'm able to apply in, in uh, uh, you know, the normal solo repertoire that I also play. Um, you know, uh, various tricks about how to make the piano, you know, create this variegated, uh, you know, uh, multi-textured kind of uh, uh, music. Um, but it's, uh, you know, although, as I said, one loses, you know, the, the varied colors that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the array of orchestral instruments is able to provide, um, 
you know, what you gain is sort of a, you know, a new perspective on what the piano can do. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, the, the pleasures of piano sound itself, which, uh, you know, the piano is in many ways, it's kind of a neutral instrument. It doesn't have, you know, as sort of distinctive a sound as an oboe or something like that. Uh, but of course it makes up for that by its incredible versatility. And, you know, by use of all of the pianistic devices, of, you know, above all pedal, but, uh, you know, also articulation and, uh, you know, our broad dynamic range and uh, obviously our very wide uh, compass, the, the, the wide range of notes from, you know, extreme bass lower than any uh, orchestral instrument can play up to higher than any orchestral instrument can play practically. Um, uh, you know, list showcases all of those possibilities of the instrument and, uh, and, you know, creates this novel sort of experience, I think, for the performer and hopefully for the, the listeners as well. Um, well, you know, I, I rather suspect <clears throat> that List might have had a similar, I have no way to prove this, of course, but that List might have had a similar um, motivation in some ways. I mean, oftentimes people refer to, uh, you know, <clears throat> motivations of uh, capitalizing on the success of some other person's work as a way, a reason that you do a transcription or this. Right. Again, these are not going into the amateur, uh, uh, you know, the, not, not going to the piano benches of, <laughs> of right. people to, uh, to just whip out and play. Um, but I think that it comes down to, I, I just imagine that it comes down to as well, this notion of being able to participate, of being able to, uh, not being an orchestral musician, having no ent entry into this. this is with all the operatic paraphrases, the Wagner transcriptions, the other things like that, beyond promotion of music that he also uh, valued, I think that there's this element of, it's a way for um, him to participate as a pianist and also, um, you know, uh, he was working on these as he was coming into prominence as a conductor as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the, you know, that's, that's a, I guess, another advantage that you might say that you have as a, as a soloist is that you're um, kind of in control of these, uh, for better or worse, <laughs> of mm -hmm. the, uh, the tempi and all the different things that, uh, that you come across. And so um, I imagine that that's kind of a, um, once you're, capable of playing it, that that's kind of a, a, a interesting uh, uh, aspect of the of the dynamic of being able to work with this music that you might otherwise be excluded from as a, as a performer. That's, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's, it's very exhilarating to have, you know, complete control of the situation. And uh, I mean, I suppose some autocratic conductors could say the same thing, but even, even in that case, I mean, you know, you, to some extent, it's out of your hands if you're a conductor. Um, and I mean, for me, it's, it's, you know, it's a fairly straightforward matter to, you know, add a little bit of time here and to uh, make certain interpretive uh, adjustments that, you know, for a conductor are extremely challenging, getting, you know, the 80 people under their command to, you uh, uh, make these adjustments. I mean, the greatest conductors obviously figure out ways, but um, I, uh, you know, I, I have open to me certain options because I'm just one person. And uh, so I think that that may also be uh, something that audiences can uh, appreciate and, and experience on some level. And uh, there's just, I mean, there is sort of this heroic kind of aspect of, you know, one person uh, being able to, uh, um, you know, encompass all of this music that's, uh, you know, adds to the, the spectacle in a way that's, uh, you know, I think that's part of the appeal of the experience. So I hope so. Sure, sure. Well, I... I think maybe before we finish up, this has been fascinating to hear you speak about these things. Um, I'm wondering if there's um, anything else that you'd like to add in particular about these, um, your performance of these pieces, um, or, uh, or what other types of projects you have in the pipeline. Uh, I, I know that this is just such an 
awkward, unknowable time right now in terms of when we're going to be able to have uh, kind of normalcy with performances. But um, I'm just curious about what kind of literature you're working on now as well, in addition to all this. You know, this is plenty to work on. I'm not right, sure. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been strange sort of planning because, uh, you know, uh, originally I was going to actually just about now I was going supposed to be finishing up my first complete cycle of performing these. Uh, and of course that has been put on hold and, uh, you know, with luck we'll get started in, you know, next fall or something like that. Um, so yeah, planning how I'm going to practice it. I mean, at this point I've now performed all nine in some venue or others. Uh, some of them I've performed several times, a couple of them I've only performed, well, number nine I've only performed once, as I said, and uh, like number one I've performed twice. Um, uh, so sort of figuring out how I'm going to manage my practice time. I mean, if I knew exactly what my schedule was going to be, then uh, that would obviously be helpful. Uh, but even, even if I knew exactly which days I'm going to wind up performing, um, still, it's it's kind of unknown, although I've played them all, sort of getting them into the hopper at just the right rate and at the right time so that I'm ready to perform them um, when concert day comes. You know, that's going to uh, it's going to be a little, uh, you know, kind of not quite guesswork because obviously uh, have Logistically other, challenging. But it, it will be an interesting challenge. I mean, I guess the the biggest, I mean, the most comparable challenge I've had is, uh, you know, I did a cycle of the 32 sonatas about 10 years ago, and uh, uh, it was a similar thing. You know, I'd performed all of them at some point, but bringing them all together to be ready at the, at the right moment, uh, obviously a lot of work and that's uh, of course that's even more music but uh, uh and you know in a way I, I view these nine symphonies as kind of the extra nine sonatas that beethoven never wrote and uh, uh so this uh, you know that this builds on that experience and uh, so hopefully it'll help me to plan it and uh with any luck you know at some point, the dates when I actually perform them will stabilize. But in the meantime, you know, these various online things give me a chance to test test drive some of the symphonies again. So as I said, one and two, I've uh, not performed very frequently yet. And so it'll be, it'll be nice to uh, sit down and, uh, uh, you know, try them out again. And uh, actually just uh, over the next two days is from from when we're speaking now uh will be when i actually make the recordings and oh so, fantastic so they're they're hot in my fingers at the moment <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> uh, but it, it's nice putting these three together i mean one and two of course uh you know being the earliest they you know you still see you know obviously a lot of the haydn influence and, um and uh, you know, occasionally there are slightly ungainly, awkward moments, awkward transitions. I mean, in both one and two, the process in the first movement of getting back to the recapitulation is, you know, it's a little, a little awkward. Uh, so you can see Beethoven still kind of finding his legs in some respects. But of course, in other respects, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's a complete mastery and uh, uh, you know it's unmistakably Beethoven it's uh, I mean his personality uh, was was fully formed and you know even the slightly ungainly moments have uh, you know a certain uh, kind of brusque dramatic charm to them which is you know a big, big part of Beethoven's personality anyway uh, and then of course by the time you get to number five uh, you know there's just there's really no note that you could quibble with, uh, I think. Um, but uh, since it's the most popular, probably, of the nine, it's uh, in some ways that's a little daunting because you know that, you know, everyone out there has their preconceptions about how it's supposed to sound. And so 
Uh, I think it's going to be impossible to satisfy everyone. Uh, and, you know, there will be people probably who, uh, you know, have trouble getting uh, past the idea that this is supposed to be an oboe here or whatever. Right. Um, but my, you know, I, I hope that, uh, you know, uh, those with, you know, a skeptical attitude coming in can, uh, you know, just uh, suspend your skepticism for a few minutes and uh, just enjoy, you know, a, a novel perspective on, uh, on these familiar experiences. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit like, you know, if you've never heard Bach played on original instruments and then you hear it that way for the first time, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, even though it's supposed to be taking you into the past, it's it's introducing you to a, a, a novel and uh, gratifying, uh, we hope, perspective. Um, you know, just to offer one suggestion that could help you with the purists out there, um, you could always play that um, oboe cadenza with the double read and just, yeah, that's all right. No, but I, I think you're absolutely right that this is it's an opportunity to hear familiar music in a new way. And I think that this brings out so many different things uh, <clears throat> that you might not you, you might just hear it differently. And if you're open to it, that's you enjoy the experience. And it's hard to not enjoy uh, these experiences. I guess my final question for you is, is there a particular one that feels the best just under the fingers, like, or, or even a particular movement that just feels like it's, to, it's, it's could have been written for piano? Huh, huh. Well, at this point, I mean, I feel that about pretty much all of them. I mean, uh, the, uh, I mean, for instance, I mean, the notorious first movement of the Fifth Symphony, I mean, there, there are aspects of that that, you know, are, are difficult on a piano, certainly. And I mean, the repeated notes, as I said, that's often a big technical problem. Uh, and, you know, both hands are, are doing it constantly because it's woven into the piece. Um, and yet, you know, it, it, at this point, I, I feel that one just, it, it works great on a piano. It, it, um, it, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the sort of unrelenting massiveness of, of uh, you know, the piano is really able to reproduce that well. And I mean, the piano has that all important advantage of having the pedal. And uh, so there are certain things you can do with the pedal that, you know, orchestras, eh, orchestras kind of have pedals. I mean, uh, I remember in, when I was taking orchestration, they're saying, you know, the French horn, that's what, the French horns are like the pedal. Um, and, uh, uh, but you know, a real pedal. There's something special about it. Yeah, I feel that uh, orchestras kind of are missing that in a way. Um, so have to it's true that that oboe solo you mentioned at the beginning of the recapitulation. Yeah, maybe it's a touch disappointing on the piano. Um, but but even there, I mean, just the the effort of sort of imagination. And, that's required, uh, you know, there's, to me, that's not an unpleasant thing. Um, anyways, yeah, so that one's a whole lot of fun to play. And, uh, you know, now that I have worked out the various intricate fingerings, I think it, it, it feels, it feels great under the fingers. Um, uh, I mean, some of the other ones, uh, there is the danger, for instance, in the last movement of the Fifth Symphony that, um, you know, it can just sort of feel like unrelenting forte fortissimo. And of course, that's true in the orchestral version also. But in the orchestral version, at least the variations of, of timbre sort of help to mitigate that problem. Uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, with that last movement of the Fifth Symphony, um, you know, that that special kind of pianistic massiveness that you can get with uh, with the help of the pedal, uh, you know, that works out pretty well too, so. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, uh, Christopher, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I'm really looking, 
we're um, all looking forward to uh, hearing the performance and um, uh, thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you in person at some point, hopefully soon. Yes, and vice versa. Thanks so much.